How to Be Orange, Chapter 19, The Real Hank and Ingrid. The quote, Shapiro turns racist. Hain style pint NL. I read it on the internet, so it must be true. I'm racist. It's a lovely conversation starter. It was a long summer day. Geert Wilders had just been voted into the top three parties in the Netherlands. On the day Wilders demanded to join the coalition talks, there was an attack on my house. While I was not a supporter of Wilders, I couldn't help but notice the kid who tried to break into my house appeared to be Dutch-Moroccan. I was in the back of the house putting the kids to bed, but it was still light outside. We heard two loud bangs, like someone kicking our front window frames. Exactly like that, in fact. I popped my head out to spot a young man in front of my house talking on his phone with an exaggerated casualness. He was walking across to his three friends, sitting on a bench with exquisite haircuts. As I found out later from the police, there is a standard technique on the rise. It involves a gang of kids, many Dutch Moroccan, who kick at people's windows during the day. If the windows open a crack, they come back at night. It was indeed a good strategy. After hearing my window being kicked and the frame cracked, I opened my door to see who was there. My first instinct was to ask the kid if he had seen anything, but I didn't want to interrupt him on the phone. I'm from the Midwest, remember. I have fairly good relationships with the teenage kids in my neighborhood. Some of them are Dutch Moroccan, which I know because I've asked them. Sometimes I'll see them congregating on my stoop. I can't blame them. It's an attractive stoop. I even tease them sometimes. Are you problem jongeren or just hang jongeren? Are you problem kids or just loitering kids? They all protest. We're just hung jongeren. We just want a place to hang out. We don't want to cause problems. I tell them, don't leave a mess, and we're all good. My policy of engagement was inspired by Job Cohen. As Amsterdam mayor, Job Cohen, he advocated drinking tea together before judging each other. As a National Labor Party candidate, Cohen thus allowed tea drinking to become a symbol of liberal weakness. What is it about tea parties that drives us to political extremes? The kids who tried to break into my house were ones I didn't recognize. They were the few bad apples who were spoiling it for the bunch. Had they no idea what was going on in that day's news? Were they deliberately trying to prove Wilders right? With that in mind, I wrote a blog piece. Why can't I trust my non-racist instincts? Why couldn't it not be a Dutch Moroccan teenager who cracked my window frame, I wrote. Why does he have to ruin it for the peaceful kids on my street? Why couldn't I see this guy in front of my house and think, shame on me for suspecting him? Why do I now have to call the police and report this incident? Why do I have to add to the statistics that VVD or PVV will use to kick out immigrants who look like him? Why do I now have to help the argument that will keep out the refugees who are not looking for a handout, who do want the crap jobs that the Dutch unemployed won't touch, and who work twice as hard as everyone else. If I ever see that damn kid again, I'll grab him by the neck and make him drink tea with me. And that's what it takes for a blog piece to go viral. The website geenstyle.nl saw my blog and wrote an item about it. Shapiro turns racist after break-in. It was the kind of article that starts out, maybe you know Shapiro from his unfunny work on Comedy Central or his boring commentary on BNR FM or his obnoxious commercials for ANWB. At first, I couldn't believe that they could be so insulting, but I quickly realized they talk this way about everyone. So it's basically decent publicity, just couched in nastiness. Bittersweet, to be sure. But that was nothing compared to the online comments. Geen style basically translates to no class. You can imagine the tone of most of the comments. To be taken seriously, it's best to start out with a personal insult. Here are some samples. Hey, jackass, you're racist. Islam is responsible for more violence than any religion. Hey, dumbass, if you love Morocco so much, why don't you move there? Hey, fuckface, I got a tip for you. Go back where you came from and take those criminal Moroccans with you. You deserve them. If I'd been stupid enough to respond, I would have said, thank you. Thanks for pointing out who's really racist. Don't forget, 
When accusing someone else of racism, please bring out all of your latent racism. Other comments had some intelligent points. Blaming Wilders is easy. You treat the immigrant as a noble savage, or you could treat him like you would treat everybody else and expose him to law and order. Fair point. No rebuttal. I just thought I'd share with you the one that didn't start out by using the word ass. And then there was this one, which amounts to a whole separate blog piece. I have no record of who wrote this. It was just pretty specific. I left the spelling intact. I just want to say that I am 100% Dutch, 19 years old. I stopped going to school to experience the life of a working class citizen. I got a job at a factory, had to redo pallets for supermarkets. I worked with two Africans, one from Kenya, the other from South Africa. 30 years old, living here since he was two, doesn't talk understandable Dutch. Those two Africans, they redid one pallet in half an hour. Me and the other white guy took only about 10 minutes per pallet. So what you say is untrue. The working class of the Netherlands is really hardworking, and we also do the crappy jobs. Now, I do want you to know I'm not racist. Yes, I did make slave jokes to the other white guy. Yes, I sometimes say Kut Marokan without me knowing if he's truly Moroccan. And yes, I voted for VVD. And I have dated colored girls and have colored friends, and I do not care where they come from as long as they are honest, polite, and hardworking. So, what a rebuttal. Personal narrative. Very strong. But then came the conclusion. Racism is part of everyone, even the black people. It's fucking normal, and it's fucking okay. So, there you have it. Doesn't matter that anyone's racist because racism is fucking okay. The attempted break-in wasn't the only incident that occurred while Wilders was on the rise. Just a couple months after the attempted break-in, there was a fight in my daughter's classroom. And who started it? The Dutch-Moroccan kid. It was the fall of 2010, right around the time Geert Wilders was preparing for his role in the Dutch government. My nine-year-old daughter came home and said something awful had happened at school. It was so bad that the parents were called in for a special meeting with the school director. While the politicians were debating the rules for the nation, we found ourselves having the same debate for just one boy. The meeting started with the school director acknowledging how unusual and awkward it was. Normally, she would never invite all the parents to discuss just one boy, especially with the boy's parents right there in the room. What she didn't acknowledge was the awkwardness of the boy's ethnicity. He was the one boy in the class with two Moroccan parents. Of course, it wasn't necessary to acknowledge it out loud, since the awkwardness was as palpable as a grip on my groin. The politically correct director handed over to the very politically correct teacher, who seemed like she had a confession to make. She explained that the boy, Mo, had a history of anger management issues. That was no secret. Mo had been in my daughter's class since preschool. She knew early on to keep her distance from this one kid. For the record, Mo had a brother, a brother who was sweet, and totally different. But in my experience as well, I'd been on school trips with the class. Mo was the most high-strung, most high-maintenance kid in the class. Next, the teacher explained her strategy for dealing with Mo. She hated to use terms like special needs, but Mo often required special attention. She explained how the class had learned to take a collective responsibility for him and care for him just as we care for each other. In this context, I couldn't help thinking it was like a parody of Labor Party talking points. Then the teacher explained what had really happened. She had allowed a group of boys to go down to the library, including Mo. Normally, there was an adult in the library room in the building, but that day there wasn't. Despite the school motto, become who you are, Mo had become teasing one of the boys for having long hair, looking like a girl, and being homo. Then the fighting broke out. One student ran to get the teacher. She arrived and broke up the fight. And what happened next was hard to explain. The teacher gave Mo a timeout. She told him he could only come back if he calmed down. Then she went out to get a cup of tea in the teacher's lounge. As parents, we were left to wonder why on earth would she take that moment for a coffee break? Moreover, was she now admitting that this was a bad decision, or was she somehow defending her decision because she'd had an unjustified faith in Mo to do the right thing? Again, it was like watching a debate with Geert Wilders and Job Cohen, or more accurately, Job Cohen debating himself. What had happened next was this. With the teacher gone, Mo went back in the class and started fighting again. 
And again, there was no adult present. The rest of the class cared for each other by telling Mo to stop fighting. That's when Mo threatened to kill everyone in the class. He picked up a chair, stood on a table, and he threw the chair, which barely missed hitting my daughter. Then Mo left the class and ran out of the building, an unchecked danger to others and to himself. How could this situation have gotten so out of hand? Did the school really think that good intentions were enough? Of course, the teacher and director apologized and explained their plans to do things differently. But then one of the parents raised his hand. Is it fair to anyone that Mo should stay in this school? And then the real debate broke out. Some parents resisted blaming the kid. Most parents felt awkward about Mo's parents being right there. Some parents protested that love was the answer and we just needed more of it. And then someone brought politics into it. With the insidious advance of right-wing politics in the capital, in the government center, this discussion is unconscionable. If we expel the only Moroccan in the class, we are no better than those right-wing ideologues in politics who are using hate to divide this country. I remembered feeling sensitive to that argument. But at the time, it felt out of place. If anything, I wanted to know why politicians were not offering more budget for the schools to provide adequate library staff, adequate adults in the building, or the remedial teaching that Mo needed. Eventually, the debate came around to the theme of fairness. As one parent put it, everyone in the class has tried to be fair to Mo, knowing that he's easily prickled. But it's gotten so bad that in gym class, if one team is beating the team with Mo, they can't cheer for fear of upsetting him. It was unfair to subject Mo to a setting where further prickles were inevitable, and it was certainly unfair that the rest of the students should be given death threats in their classroom. As the only American in the room, I could only think of the situation in American schools, and I was glad that here there'd only been threats. And then the school director turned it over to the parents. The school had decided that Mo would be suspended and likely moved to another school. Was there anyone who objected? Mo's parents did object. No one else. Again, I was left to wonder, why now? I'd been living peacefully in my neighborhood for eight years without a break-in. Kurt Wilders places third in the national election and my house is attacked. Why now? The Dutch-Moroccan kid in my daughter's class was trouble, but never life-threatening. Why did Mo wait all this time to freak out? Why now? Was it just a coincidence? Were they intent on proving Kurt Wilders right? Or was Wilders creating some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy? Kurt Wilders became known for his quotes about Hank and Ingrid, his definition of the prototypical Dutch couple. We're here for Hank and Ingrid in this country, not for Ali and Fatima, said Wilders. Of course, he was just generalizing. I mean, can you imagine if there would be a real couple who just happened to be named Hank and Ingrid? And what if they would live in, say, Almelo in the east of the country? And what if they'd happened to get into a fight with their neighbor who happened to be Turkish and he happened to end up dead? That's exactly what happened in 2012. A Dutch couple got into a fight with their Turkish neighbor. They bashed his head against the pavement and reportedly yelled, go to hell, you dirty Turk. Would they have ever felt quite so violent if their names weren't Hank and Ingrid? We'll never know. That incident got me thinking about another episode, one of my first encounters with Dutch Moroccan kids. I was biking home after work late on a Friday night. I'd had a good show. I was a little buzzed after a few beers, and I was making my way back to Bos and Lomer. It was a nice summer night, meaning there was no wind or rainstorm for a change, and I thought I might try calling my brother in L.A. I got his voicemail, so I left a drunken message, which was abruptly cut off. Why? Read on. There's a spot along the Jan van Galenstraat where you never know what to expect. You can either risk your life with the trucks on the main road, or you can risk your life on the side road with whoever's coming out of that dodgy dance club, the grow-your-own-weed shop, or the Fabo snack shop. Tonight, I chose the side road, where a group of young guys was walking in the street. They were taking up the middle of the street when the sidewalk was wide open and inviting. So perhaps, yes, there was a little extra attitude in my bell ringing, and I should have predicted that instead of making way, they would block the street even more. What happened next is best described in the voicemail my brother saved and played for me later. Tring, 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 tring. Pass up! Hey! Wah! Crash! Thump! Tring! Boop, boop, boop! This call has been disconnected. 
So here's the play-by-play. Just as the group opened up a bit to let me through, one of the guys elbowed me and knocked me off my bike. And then they kept on going. When I got back up again, I was livid and stupid. The fact that there were five of them somehow made no difference to my righteous sense of indignation. I yelled after them, ASOS, which is short for asocial, which is antisocial, and is more accurate than insulting. I was just proud of myself that I was yelling in Dutch. One of the gang turned around and walked back to me. What did you say? I repeated myself, and to his surprise, as well as mine, I threw myself onto him, wrestling him to the street. Mercifully, his friends were equally stunned, and for some reason, they didn't start kicking the shit out of me. The reason became apparent as the police car pulled up, and the fight was over as soon as it had started. The police officers split us up and took each of us aside. I was a tall white man in a suit. He appeared to be a teenage Dutch Moroccan boy, accompanied by more teenage Dutch Moroccans. It didn't take long for the police to choose sides. Before they let me go, they did yell at me for behaving like an idiot. I could have been killed. Worse, I could have killed him. Then I'd have had to change my name to Hank or Ingrid. Of course, that was years before Geert Wilders was in power, and now that he's out of power, I've personally had less trouble with Dutch Moroccan kids. What does that prove? If it proves anything, it's that I'm only a half-assed sociologist. It's also pretty clear that I'm a lazy idealist, a part-time pessimist, a fence-straddling hypocrite, and sometimes a brawling drunk. But I hope I'm not really racist.